Europe today is on the tracks of a centuries-old dream, the unity of its member countries. Linked by 100 mile an hour expresses serving 90 of its main towns and cities, it's on the move. Away from its ancient feuds, its suspicions and divisions, across the frontiers on wheels of trade. And business is so brisk that the railway provides travelling secretaries for executives who like to clear their in-trays en route. It's almost as easy to travel between the countries of Western Europe today as it is to move between one city and another in any one of them. Passport checks are simple and reflect the new mood of freedom coming from the heart of the reborn continent, the common market. In the common market, the barriers are gradually coming down, the barriers to trade, the barriers to the free movement across frontiers of goods, services, money and people. And Europe is on the way to unity on the trade winds of change. At the speed she's going, the European community will be rid of all artificial barriers to trade by 1970. It was here in Rome in 1957 that statesmen of France, Germany, Italy, Holland, Belgium and Luxembourg agreed to set up the European economic community, which most people call the common market. They moved on to Brussels to turn this brainchild of French statesman Jean Monnet into reality and to set up the organization to put the Treaty of Rome into operation. And now the Belgian capital is the market center. This is the powerhouse, the headquarters of the Common Market Commission appointed by the six governments to see to the day-to-day -day running of the community and where the mail can bring anything from a note from a head of state to a small businessman's query about customs dues. Each of the six nations that signed the Treaty of Rome experienced defeat or occupation or both in the Second World War. Each wanted to put an end to the old quarrels, to tear down the barriers that helped keep Europe divided into small protected markets. Now their common market area covers 170 million people, an economic unity comparable with those of the United States and Russia. And here's the man with a massive job of running it, Professor Walter Holstein, who with eight colleagues heads that body of common market civil servants who are sometimes called the Eurocrats. Working to a timetable set by the six governments for the removal of all trade barriers within 12 to 15 years, from the time the market came into business, they make their decisions on a straight majority vote. That bell, symbolically, is a miniature of the Liberty Bell that rings in West Berlin every day. The 2,000 civil servants working here, many of them economists and lawyers, agree to serve the interests of the community rather than the interests of their own countries. The nationalities are scrambled. Under a director general of one nationality will be directors of another and heads of divisions of a third. Today, the common market pulse is beating fast. With the market has come fresh confidence and a booming prosperity. For Europe, it's get up and go into an urgent world of competition and expansion, of business conferences in faraway capitals and back for more work before the day ends. With Brussels the focus of all this activity, nearly 200 international business organizations have taken offices in the city recently. And even number plates on the community civil servants' cars show the European trend. So do the imaginative highways like this road network in once devastated Rotterdam, which is now the main tradesman's entrance into Europe. Under the symbolic Euromast, where you can dine with a view of common market commerce, is a boom port turning round millions of tons of world shipping. Through these harbours passes much of the community's trade with the world outside, a trade that's made the community the largest importer on earth, buying thousands of millions of pounds worth of goods every year, including one third of the world's raw materials. Inside the community, agriculture has its problems. Farmers are protected by levies and guaranteed prices. But for fruit and vegetable growers, it's a case of straight competition. Here, in what's called the Greenhouse District of Holland, 
growers and buyers handle tomatoes and grapes, lettuces and cauliflowers by the barge load. In this area alone, the turnover runs into some 30 million pounds a year, a quarter of the total for Holland's horticulture. And the rules are those of the traditional auction which is all the keenness of the competitive common market. You make your bid for that consignment in front of your very eyes by stopping the electric clock. The first bid buys, and you've got to be quick on the button to beat your rivals, but not too quick, or you'll be paying too high a price. Holland, like France and Italy, is a large exporter of agricultural products. And from here, the boxes go out, not only to all the common market countries, but also to Britain. As the common market develops, Countries and areas within countries will increasingly specialise in the things they're best at, like the traditional tulip growers of Holland. Already the supermarkets of Europe are offering a much greater range and variety of food and wines than they used to. In Holland, for instance, you can now find some French and Italian wines that were less easy to buy before the common market began. But it's two-way traffic, and the Dutch, believe it or not, are even selling grapes to the Italians. Fair competition is one of the community's aims, and it's the man in the street who must benefit as the tariff walls come down and the housewife, of course. One noticeable effect of the common market has been the forward march of Italian designers. As import taxes on Italian shoes have steadily fallen, along with those on other goods, they're now only half what they were four years ago, so the girls have bought more. And now Italy is sending out millions of pairs a year to its common market partners. And it's certainly not only in Rome that they're doing as the Romans do these days. For Italy, above all, is exporting her flair for design. This talent for style is probably Italy's main contribution to the community. It runs all the way from shoes to architecture and cars. The Italian line is in. Its influence can be seen not only in the number of Italian cars on Europe's roads, but also in the styling of cars made in other countries, even outside the community. Car manufacturing is one of the most fiercely competitive industries in the community, and between them, the manufacturers are turning out well over three million cars a year. By 1970, all the capitals and main industrial centres of the six cities like Cologne here will be linked by high-speed motorways, and on the railways too, it's all systems go. Where 10 years ago there were some 200 diesel locomotives, there are now more than 3,500. And in some cases, it really is quicker to move from one city to another by rail than by air. Free movement of workers between the countries of the community is another aid. These railwomen outside Cologne are from Italy. Thousands more have been absorbed by Germany's thriving industry, which now employs around a million foreign workers. Here in Hamburg, where shipyards are at full stretch and new vessels are being launched at the rate of 90 a year, shortage of skilled labor is more of a problem than getting orders. The Italians working alongside Germans here are entitled to German social security benefits and also the same high wages. In Germany, wage rates have gone up by a third since 1958, when the common market was started. Controls on the movement of capital are being gradually lifted under the common market timetable. Where there's money, there's a new look, as in the transformed industrial city of Dusseldorf with its high wages and living standards. Where there's money too, there's heavy industry. Here in Duisburg, they're turning out the plant needed by Europe's factories to produce the vast range of goods 
for 170 million people inside the market as well as for a growing market outside. Here they're making the machinery that puts muscle into the common market. Here are the castings, the lathes, the gear wheels, the hard realities of a healthy economy, the shop floor power behind Europe's spectacular progress. In France, too, are all the signs of this seeking after a better life by a people who know all about good living. France has found a new reconciliation with her age-old enemy, Germany. Today's routes from France into Germany are among the main arteries of a new Europe determined to live prosperously as one unit. And already the first big stage is completed. In 1952, the European coal and steel community, the forerunner of the common market, was set up. By now, it has got rid of all barriers to trade in coal and in that vital necessity of the modern world, steel, here being made at Thionville. All aids and subsidies have gone and the rules of the open market apply. Steel production has gone up so fast that the community is now making almost as much steel as America and something like a quarter of the world's total. It amounts to a revolution in one of Europe's most powerful industries, a revolution managed from a tiny state in the heart of the continent, that dowager of the common market, the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. A country only a thousand square miles in area and with only about 300,000 people. Here, Europe's coal and steel community has its headquarters, from which has come the strong line that's kept competition healthy by preventing harmful mergers and monopolies. And the Grand Duchy is no mean steel maker herself. Rich in iron ore, she turns out some three million tons of iron and steel a year. One plant that's sprung up in recent years is half in Luxembourg, half in France. A factory as up to date as the idea of which it's a symbol, straddling a frontier which runs right through its rolling mill. For steel workers here as elsewhere in Europe, progress has brought higher rail wages, better housing, greater freedom of movement. And there are safeguards against unemployment should the pace slacken. But the pace is still white hot as the industry continues to grow. And the steel mills of the community are in sight of a target of 82 million tons of steel a year. Europe is in a hurry and Europe knows where it's going. As frontiers dissolve into mere blurs along the tracks between Paris, Brussels and Amsterdam, Hamburg and Milan, life moves faster. Trans-Europe express drivers are steadily increasing their speed. Soon it'll be up to 200 kilometers an hour. And crossing from one country to another can mean little more than a handover like this between drivers of different nationalities. And now Strasbourg. The picturesque French city on the Rhine and the German border has become a symbol of the European ideal, a centre of reconciliation between the French and the Germans, and the seat of European parliamentary democracy. Here, perhaps, is the future Westminster of Europe. Here come the ministers and the members of parliament to talk, not in national terms, but in the language of Europe. Here they are forging together the democratic basis of a future United States of Europe. Today, the flags of Europe's sovereign states of the mid-20th century are flying as ministers arrive, led by the French foreign minister, for yet another conference. The European community not only has its parliament, but also its councils of ministers to coordinate policies and to take decisions which will be directly binding throughout the community. They can support or turn down the Common Markets Commission's ideas by a majority vote, but they can only amend those ideas by a unanimous vote. And in the Council of Ministers, voting is weighted. France, Germany and Italy have four votes each, Belgium and Holland two each, and Luxembourg one. A similar rule applies to the European Parliament, where France, Germany and Italy have 36 members each, 
Belgium and Holland 14 each, and Luxembourg 6, all elected by their own parliaments. They meet six times a year and don't sit in national groups, but according to their political views. They check on the community's spending, and here Professor Holstein is reporting on the Common Market Commission's work. Parliament has power to sack the entire commission. As the president of the commission speaks inside, the starred flag of Europe flies outside on the soil of France, yet higher even than the tricolor. Even in the best ordered of societies, disputes can arise. And here in Luxembourg sits the European Court of Justice, seven judges appointed jointly by the member states to act as a community supreme court. The court ensures the rule of law. Its judgment is final in all matters under the Treaty of Rome. Cases can be brought by the Commission, by governments, even by private firms and individuals. Judgments are backed by the full force of law. Europe has come a long way since the devastation and misery of two world wars. And it is against this background of change and bold ideas that Britain has been negotiating her entry into the common market. Yet for all that's been done, the full effect will not be seen in our lifetime, but in that of the children. And here in Luxembourg is another remarkable institution, one of the new European schools. Here the sons and daughters of men and women civil servants of the European community are educated on European lines. And among them is an English boy, young Nicholas of Bolton, Lancashire. European affairs may not mean much to him, but he knows one thing, that he and his schoolmates have a lot of fun growing up together, with language no obstacle and frontiers no barrier.